if you're in this room, you're all, you are already on the, you know, the precipice, on the edge of innovation, of in, inside industry, you're carving out the future. And uh, I'm from InGenesis, and at InGenesis, we help entrepreneurs and leaders shape and carve that future uh, by working with them to build ventures and take them to the market. So the conversation I'm having with you today is about entrepreneurship and leadership, whether that means that you want to work in a startup or, or build your own startup, whether you're going to be working in even a traditional company needs to be innovating today, right? So you, you're either on a, a, model, a business model that is on a time limit, or you are creating a new business model that is setting the future, okay? And what I'd like you to do, uh, we've got today where I'm going to start talking to you about uh, how we work in ventures and how we work in technology, which I believe that no matter whether you, you are planning to, again, lead a company, be in a team, lead a team, or yourself be part of an innovative team, these are things that you will, you will and can use in the industry uh, to apply what you're getting here today in, in the real world. So. To start off with, I'd like to share something that uh, we realise many people are not present to, especially in Australia and the Asia Pacific region, which is that venture capital, right, the investment into new businesses is $70 billion in uh, Asia and Asia Pacific, in comparison to the USA, which is at about $72 billion. So we are right on the verge of our entire region that we're in having as much activity as there is in uh, the United States, which obviously gets a lot of fanfare and is on the news and, and all of that, as you'd be aware. So what does that mean for you and me, for people sitting in here? Well, one thing that we've identified is technology is moving at such a rapid pace. Uh, Peter Diamandis, who is the uh, founder of the XPRIZE, a, a rapidly innovating uh, an organization that helps with humanity's problems, says that from the year uh, 1900 to 2000, think about all of the innovations that happened, right? We had the car, the TV, the internet. That same amount of innovation and change was from 2000 to 2016. Right, so in 16 years, 100 years worth of innovation happened. And he's predicting again from 2016 to 2022, we are going to experience that entire change once more over. Not only that, the transfer of wealth is going to be just as large as those time periods. Yeah? So there's no coincidence today that you, know, you are the people sitting here, we're talking about blockchain, uh, we're partly talking about cryptocurrency, the future of finance and, and banking and, and so many other industries. And one thing I say working with a, a lot of startups is that the same energy we would put into investing in a restaurant, right? We have to get the equipment, we have to hire the staff, we have to build a team, get customers. That same level of investment and energy these days you can put into a technology or a scale-based startup, and instead of serving thousands of customers, you're literally serving hundreds of thousands to millions of customers, right? And it, it's it, in the work that we do, it's a daily occurrence. However, the issue is that there is a huge skills gap, right? Uh, it's, you can't just go and create a, a company like this and, and just learn it on the, on the street you need to know how to do it the same way you would fly a plane. Uh, so that this is some of the things that I'm gonna be going through today uh, in my hope that you will take this and everything you're doing here can be applied to industry and can be applied to the workforce and so on and, and, and so forth. And I was speaking with some people in the break about how the bridge between what we're doing here uh, in a university and what's happening in the commercial world, that bridge is one of the most valuable bridges right now, right? Without that bridge, we have all of these amazing solutions that don't go out into the world. And that's one thing at InGenesis we are very, uh, uh, have a huge focus on, 
because we do believe that entrepreneurship at the end of the day is a unique vehicle that will allow us to solve many of humanity's problems, right? So yeah, we, right now we are in a very unique opportunity and I, I would invite you to sort of zoom out and see where we are and we are looking at how today do these ideas go and, and make it in the world. And as we did this, so our founder, Ashkan Tashvir, uh, was one of the people who quite young in his early 20s uh, built a, it was a modular accounting software that went up to about 180 was a team and one of the top three softwares in his country. And he moved out to Australia to then, you know, expand his global reach. And he always saw that entrepreneurship is this special vehicle that I just talked about. And uh, why he created in Genesis was that he wanted more and more people to be uh, interacting in this way, taking their solutions and putting it out into the world. And one of the things that we looked at in Genesis was we first had to come to realize that there are mechanics behind entrepreneurship, right? In the media, there's all of this fanfare that there's luck and this and that, and the stories of the, the college dropout, you know, going and building a bi billion dollar business, there's actually very few of those. And statistically, the majority are tertiary educated people. Uh, not, not to say that's all of them, but essentially uh, people like you and me, people who have worked in the industry, but then have an idea that they want to take and scale out to serve a lot of people, uh, those are the people who are, who are doing it. And one place of reference we looked at the early days of Ingenesis was the PayPal Mafia. Just a show of hands who, who have ever heard of the PayPal Mafia before? A couple of people? Fantastic. So let me first go through this circle. Uh, just put up your hand if you've heard of YouTube. Okay, I'm actually seeing if anyone is not paying attention. Uh, LinkedIn? Yeah. Tesla and SpaceX, yeah. Uh, Kiva, I love Kiva. Yeah, a couple of people. Uh, and how about Yelp, yeah. So these are all household names. What, what very few people know is that all of these companies came out of what we call the PayPal Mafia. These were the people who were part of the core team building PayPal in the days where e-commerce didn't even exist, right? And after they sold their shares out of PayPal, I mean, definitely Elon Musk would be the most uh, popular version of this, right? Where there he is, $180 million in the bank. And what does he do? Instead of going to some in a tropical island, he goes, I'm going to choose the top uh, problems that I think need to be solved in the world and I'm gonna dump all of my money into that and you know, go and make this happen, right? So inside of this core team that started PayPal, all of these companies have come out and there's a repeatable process that they've been able to use to go and create large scale companies. So inside in Genesis, we have identified that this, this movement from these ideas and these innovations into a commercial sustainable business that's the game. And the more people we can work with to go along this journey, the better. So what do we look at? Well, when you have a startup, obviously you start in the ideation phase, right? You've got an idea. Often people at this stage, people are working, they're studying, and they have this little pet project that you know, they're getting off the ground. That's what the ideation stage is about. Now, fast forward. It could be one year, it could be 10 years, eventually a company gets established, right? Now there's a lot of different uh, sort of research slash opinions about this. In general, something like 50 to 100 employees and a place where you no longer are asking the question whether your product is, is wanted in the market, right? You, you are no longer searching. What you are doing is uh, that's been answered and then you're simply scaling it to more and more people, right? What else is happening in the established phase? Well, you've got everything there, and then you can use traditional salespeople. You can build a sales team, marketing people, you can do all of that. 
The difference with the startup phase is there, there are so many moving parts that you can't hire those types of people, right? In fact, you can't even have a full team, and I'm going to get into that later. So what we do at InGenesis is uh, it's a passion of ours to work in this startup to scale process. And all of our uh, IP, all of what we call our startup to scale engines are designed to support entrepreneurs through this process. Now, when I say entrepreneurs, I want you guys to hear me in so many different levels, right? So this is why we call it entrepreneurs and leaders, because what we've seen is that the entrepreneur, the context of the entrepreneur has changed, yeah? So many corporations now have, you know, dedicated innovation managers and so on and so forth, because the conversation is going on that they know they are an industry ripe for disruption and they will either come up with that or someone else is going to come up with that and you know they need to stay ahead of the game so whether you are you know imagining yourself inside the garage of the next you know startup or you're imagining yourself in a, a large company there will still be that entrepreneurship and leadership required moving in uh, to, to the current you know commercial world that you'll need to know these types of things so we zoom into this difficult phase where things go from zero to a level of sustainability uh, and, and we started asking ourselves what is required to support people through this process. And we found that there were three and only three things that were required, right? So the first thing is what we call startup ready. And this is where people are going from that ideation phase I was talking about, where they're, they're thinking, oh, is this a good idea, right? That usually you hear you know, a, a friend or a family talking about their idea at a barbecue and things like that. And they are trying to find out whether this is something that is just a passing thought or it is something that they really should take seriously. So what we do at InGenesis is work with people through this to get to a place where they, can, they know that they've got a strong foundation and should further invest. The second stage is investment ready. So this is where people are starting to build something but they don't quite have everything focused and they don't have what they need to go in front of an investor and say, hey, this is what we are going to do. This is the market we are going to take. The last one is scale ready. Uh, so there's a big difference for building, you know, uh, on your computer a little piece of software compared to something that takes millions upon millions of hits a day. Uh, and as, we, as you know, we had the presentation from AWS and a lot of work goes into making something scalable, a lot of work behind the scenes. So we work on that on, at a business level and on a technology level. Okay. And so what, what does it look like? Well. What we've found is that at the beginning, uh, I'll, let, let me repeat that, there's a lot of people, uh, venture capitalists in particular, who have done research about why companies fail in these innovative stages. And one of them is that they scale too early, right? So what we do at InGenesis is we first work at, at the startup phase and we get them to clarify their their idea. Let me just move through this. So we get them to first clarify their idea, identifying whether they're on a seed or whether they've picked up a stone. We've actually met with people who for, for two years they've been working on their idea and they eventually realise that their idea in the first place wasn't scalable at all. And we, we you know, wonder why they haven't asked you know, that question before. Inside the uh, venture design program, the building program, what we've found is people have come to us to say, uh, hey, Aria, we just spent $500,000 building our program, yeah? And we're so excited, but we've got one question. And I say, what's that? Well, how do I get my first customer? And we realize that there are so many people out there who, who don't really have a clear idea how to move along the business side as well as the product side, okay? So one thing that we've seen inside venture capital when people invest into these early stage companies is what can we add over and above capital because the statistics show that 75% of these ventures 
even after they are funded, only only or oh, seventy five percent end up com being complete failures and, and not making a return at all. Yeah. So what uh, venture capitalists have been saying is this, and they've started to talk about different service layers. In other words, instead of just giving capital to a team, there are other elements at play that we need to you know, focus on in order to build a large scale company. So at Ingenesis, these are the four scale up engines that we look at. Uh, the first one is Ingenesis Ventures. We look at how can you get that, that product market fit and working rapidly to build your business model. In the second place, in Genesis Technology. So that's where we are looking at agile teams and how they can be implemented to create highly scalable technology. Third one is in Genesis Investments. Obviously, you know, having fuel to uh, uh, fuel your fire is important. And then finally, in Genesis Thrive, which, which I'm going to be speaking about uh, on the last day of the hackathon, which is about human and team capital. So it's said that in Facebook. Uh, the, if you go and look at how much they capitalize per person, is actually two million American dollars, right? They're, they're the number one in the world at being able to get value out of their employee. And uh, the, the actual uh, talent acquisition brokers have come out saying that Facebook is able to purchase uh, teams and individuals at between 500K to $1 million for that team or human capital. What does that mean? Well, it means that very few people actually see this hidden value, uh, but there are some people in the world who do acknowledge it. And that's what we do at Ingenesis Thrive. We look at building, training, high-performance teams that you know, undertake the whole journey. So what I'd like to do is go into Ingenesis Ventures about how we uh, go about uh, uh, building a business model and, and so on and so forth. So as I mentioned, we have the an initial stage where people come in with just an idea. And what we do with them is we first look at their passion, right? Because what, what we've found is that uh, because of all of the hype on the media, then it looks like, okay, if I have an idea, I can go in and I can create this large company, raise millions of dollars and so on. And it's a huge distraction. And investors know this as well. Because if money is the only obstacle, then, you know, it could be, uh, sorry, if money is the only objective, then if you're hitting these obstacles where you are out of resources, it's going to take you out of the game. When we look at someone like Steve Jobs, uh, it looks so, uh, you know, glimmery that all of the successes of the iPod and the iPhone. But many people don't actually see that there were years where Steve Jobs was at the head of the company when it was losing $1 billion, right? And so to, to be motivated to drive a company in, that, in the face of that takes huge character. So one thing we do in the very early stage working with people is we see if they have the right motivations that this is something that they would do uh, in the face of challenge. And this is very important even in, in corporations. Uh, you know, they are starting to develop more about what is the real motivation of our people so that it is fulfilling regardless of only the monetary uh, benefits. The other side is the market. So with the market, we want to know if there are people who are hungry for our solution. Yeah? As I mentioned before, we've met a lot of people who work so hard, 10 years of building something and they, they end up not having a single customer, right? So one thing we do is we actually get our, our startups to get 10 expressions of interest from uh, industry to see that this is a real problem that is worth solving, yeah? So with that alignment, with that market, we find that they have a, a very valuable seed that they can then go and build upon. So this is what I was mentioning. In, that, in the first stage, what we have is whether you pick up that seed or, or, or that uh, rock. Uh, but in the second stage, the getting people investment ready, that's when we're starting to refine uh, this, this idea down into something crystal. And we take the analogy of diamond cutting, right? So there you are, you've got this very rough diamond. The value is in there. 
but it needs to be cut and sliced until you have something you know, very, very polished. And one process that we do is we go through with people from uh, when they have you know, a half-baked product and so on, we want them to be standing there with an investor. And in one hand, what they've got is a very uh, uh, clear roadmap of how they are going to take that market. And they've done the research for how that market really, how big it is. Yeah? Feedback we've had from our investors is that this is one of the most important pieces that the market is very, very well researched. Yeah? So you can imagine having that. On the other hand, we do, in, in our language, we call it a UI UX prototype, which is every single uh, screen developed, uh, sorry, designed and clickable, even though the back end isn't done. So think about opening up Uber and going through the map and being able to call a, a cab without the cab actually coming, right? Now, if you're an investor sitting there, having these two things ha hold extraordinary power. Why? Because you as an investor are about to give money to these people to simply carry out this plan. Yeah? Uh, one mistake we've seen a lot of people make is they are, are expecting these funds to just come, not really seeing that, you know, uh, what they are going to do for the, that investor. Yeah? So we fi find this, this is a very simple and clear way that gets early stage investors on board. Uh, and it's very, there's a very different process uh, in doing that compared to having someone go, oh, we are going to uh, attack this general industry and we need roughly between 500K to a million dollars. Being able to go to them instead and say, it's going to take us you know, 90 days of work to build this. And on this hand, this is how big the industry and this is the steps we're going to take. It's a, it's a very compelling offer you know, uh, to the investor. Secondly, I'd like to talk about uh, Ingenesis Investments. Uh, I won't spend too long on this, but in short, we work with people who are out to add value above and beyond capital, as I mentioned. And what we are really interested in are uh, people who see, you know, the, the intention is to build innovation and get these products out there rather than only being uh, a focus on the return. Uh, now, ov obviously that means we have quite a select few, but it also means that when they're investing themselves, they're typically adding value to the company from day one. Thirdly, in Genesis technology, so uh, if you are someone who, uh, if I can just get a show of hands, who thinks that they're gonna be or already are working in a technology company? Yeah? And who in the future sees themselves as being part of a technology team? Yeah, so that pretty much covers everyone in the room. Now, what I'd, want to, I'd like to share with you is how uh, in these early stage companies, the challenges that we experience uh, are getting this out to launch. The first thing is to see that uh, this was done by the Standish Group, that 71% of software projects are not considered successful, right? And the analogy I, I'd like to give is, imagine that we went to build 10 houses, right? We've paid the money, we've hired the construction uh, uh, people, and there we are one year later, and out of the 10 that we have paid for, only three of those houses are left standing and are fully done, ready to live in. Well, that is the current state of affairs when we're talk talking about software uh, uh, projects and software product. And for us, this is a very deep uh, burning, a very deep pain point, because you think about how much energy it takes to firstly come up with the idea, to secondly get your whole team together, right? You're getting people committed and, in, and involved in your uh, enterprise. And then you're going out to find commercial partners and, and people who want to be your customer. This is saying that even once you do all of those very challenging things, still when you go to build, only three out of 10 are going to successfully make it. And if I can share a personal story, a, a previous uh, technology startup that uh, I was involved in, we had four, uh, a pro, four separate teams we built and four separate uh, product collapses before we started getting it right. So it's a very expensive exercise 
And what we've found is that it's only people who have been through the process themselves and learnt the lessons that they, they get the real depth of this. In addition to that, what we've seen is that, especially in Australia, so let me just read this from Mike Cannon-Brooks from Atlassian, uh, and he's mainly talking about the government uh, visa restrictions. He says that the restrictions are suffocating our ability to become a leading innovation nation and fundamentally threatening Atlassian's ability to remain headquartered here, right? And there are a lot of other stories like this, uh, but this is a, a very key one. So here we are in Australia. I know that if you're sitting here, you're in a very good position in that it's a very, uh, you know, great talent is very rare in this space in Australia. And uh, Ashkan Tashri, our founder at Ingenesis, experienced this working in the corporate environment where he was accountable to uh, deliver global reaching software and he, it was very difficult to find a team and put together a team here uh, that could really make, make the difference. And so he himself ended up going to India and meeting with 62 different uh, vendors, companies, trying to find people that he could rely on and build these global reaching softwares. In the end, he couldn't find any apart from a, a very small group that he then uh, became non-executive chairman, started injecting his own culture, philosophy and practices uh, into the team that, that he could then rely on. And, and that team actually today uh, makes up in Genesis India and uh, is part of the agile teams we deploy uh, for, our, for our softwares. So I'd like to share with you a couple of things that we do that are quite unique. And you know, we have a saying here in, in Genesis that about 80% of the people we interact with are going to benefit from you know, simply what we're sharing with them. It's only about 10 or 20% that we end up working with, but we really have the intention that the whole industry can take these lessons on so that you know, we are not wasting human resources in the world uh, and we bring more pro uh, solutions to our problems into the market. So the first one I'd like to share is about UI UX prototyping. Uh, in my experience in previous startups, what I found is that we had the whole executive team there and we would say, hey, uh, this is the idea for the software, the product, let's, let's all go build it. The technology team would go away and three months later come back and say, here it is, uh, a leadership team, executive team, this is what we've come up with. And you know, we'd look around at all of the board and everyone would be shaking their heads saying, no, you know, that's not right at all, let's throw that out and start again. And at, be at the beginning, you, you sort of think, okay, maybe it was just uh, a bad luck, right? But when you see it over and over again, you realize that there's something systematic going on that we're missing steps. So now we do acknowledge that quite a few people are taking this on uh, in, in terms of UI UX prototyping, but this is where we map every single screen on UI UX and we get that all uh, approved, we get all of that signed off before we move on. In our own planned agile methodology, this allows us to estimate down to the day how many development days it's gonna take before launch. And this is something that investors really love uh, because they're able to take that ambiguity out of the business side of, of getting a product out there. The final thing I'd like to talk to is about those uh, agile teams on demand. I mentioned on the established side that we can hire a full scale team. And uh, what we've seen is that you at least need seven talents, right, from separate uh, specialities to make a technology company today, right? And this is, you're looking at somewhere between 700K to a million dollars per year just to fund that team in Australia. So those are things like the CTO, someone broadly looking at the strategy, uh, someone like a, a product manager or project manager to obviously bring people together just like you would in a, constructing a home. Uh, then you need uh, the UI UX designer, someone to design it and look nice. The other person is uh, the solutions engineer, right? The person who, if you're building on a slanted ground, they are gonna do all the mathematics to make sure that the house can stand up. They then will lead you to that front end and back end developer who will be the bricklayers and they will write the code to actually construct the house. 
Finally, you've got uh, QA, the quality assurance, to make sure that everything was as, you know, as constructed as it was uh, as wished. So this is just the bare minimum of what we need to build high quality, highly scalable technology. And so what we've done inside Ingenesis technology is that we have those teams there, but we deploy them uh, you know, to multiple ventures at once. And this means that more people in that middle stage uh, get the advantage of building a very, very quality product, but without having to hire you know, seven different talents and manage each one, hire them, see that two months later, you know, they're, they're not a match and so on and so forth. Fantastic. So uh, outside of that, we'll be continuing, as I mentioned uh, in the final day, we'll be sharing a bit more of, about the industry. Uh, but secondly, we'll be holding the pitching workshop. And outside of that, if you are interested in either one, uh, doing something your, yourself uh, now or in the future, or you're part of uh, uh, or interested in being involved in that space, you know, please come and see me. And uh, yeah, again, really acknowledge everyone being here today and doing what you're doing uh, on the cutting edge of uh, the industry. Thank you so much.